thank you for uh, logging in tonight to our second webinar. Um, our first webinar last year was quite um, uh, an interesting event through COVID and, and we figured that it, it's a good thing for us to continue to do to highlight different aspects of our research centre here at Macquarie and other aspects of our clinical work um, that is uh, that is ongoing in our battle to see our world free from motor neurone disease. So again, thank you all for, for uh, attending tonight. And the format of tonight is really quite simple. Um, we have five little segments, each of about 10 minutes. Um, uh, I'm gonna lead off the batting tonight, talking about some of our work in clinical trials. Um, then I'll hand over to Gilles, uh, um, who's our um, expert in inflammatory uh, uh, changes in motor neurone disease, but also he's gonna talk tonight about the environmental clues to why motor neurone disease has increased by more than 250% as a cause of death in Australia. Angela Laird then will talk about our zebrafish unit and its usefulness as a model for new therapies in trying to slow and stop motor neurone disease. Um, Rosie Fell will then talk about one of the aspects that very, is very close to my heart and that's you know, supporting our families with genetic causes of motor neurone disease as 10% as of motor neurone disease is genetic. And then we have two very special guests, Caitlin and Jessica to talk about their first person experience of genetic counseling and moving forward through making the decision to get tested for one of the genes that may cause motor neurone disease. So we're then gonna have a question and answer session. And so there's a, there's a question um, button down the bottom of your screen. Um, uh, and so we'll have about half an hour for questions. So we won't stop for questions on the way through, um, but we will try and get to as many questions as we can in half an hour at the end. Um, the format's fairly straightforward. Um, we're gonna try and stick to time. Um, if we slide a little bit past time, we'll have to eat into the question time. But don't worry, your questions will be answered. If we can't answer them in the webinar, we'll try and answer them um, by text or in replying to you directly. The webinar is being recorded, so it will go up on the university's YouTube channel tomorrow. And there will be a transcript of the webinar uh, next week if people want to look at the actual um, presentations. Um, hopefully everyone knows where all your exits are. And if you don't know where your toilets are, um, it's too late. Um, I hope you've got a cup of tea or something stronger. Uh, strap in and, and we're gonna uh, start the webinar. So I'm gonna start out by talking about some of the stuff that we've been doing in clinical trials over the last um, year or so. So hopefully that's a single screen. Can someone yell at me if that's uh, still in presentation mode? But <clears throat> what I wanna do is talk about um, uh, further investigations on some data that I shared with you last year. And this is trials to slow and stop motor neurone disease. So we have six trials going on at the moment of various aspects of motor neurone disease. And again, just to clarify the different phases in trials. So phase one trial is where you're working out whether a therapy is safe to give people. Phase two is that you're trying to work out the best dose to give people to try and have a biological effect and whether there are, whether you can see that there are signals of efficacy. And a phase three trial is where we actually work out whether the new therapy is better than standard therapy. So I'm gonna elaborate on two trials that I talked to you about last year, the Lighthouse trial and the Copper ATSM trial. <clears throat> so two years ago, we published the Lighthouse trial, which is which was a trial that was run in Australia, and it was working out whether we could repurpose a drug called Triamec that we've stolen from the HIV world to see whether we could slow and uh, sporadic motor neurone disease. 
So this was uh, a collaboration that was catalyzed by Julian Gold, who runs the Albion Centre in the city, which is where a lot of the HIV patients in Sydney get treated. So you say, why should we be treating motor neuron disease patients with a drug from the HIV world? Well, the science behind it is that in throughout evolution, we have these viral remnants that are captured up in our DNA. And these viral remnants are called human endogenous retroviruses or HERVs. And there are various different HERVs that we've accumulated through evolution. And one of the more recent acquisitions into our DNA is one called HERV-K. Now, to put it in context, this is a schematic of our DNA, our chromosomes. And only about 3% of our DNA encodes for genes that turn us into us. 8% of our DNA is made up of these viral remnants that we've acquired over millions of years through evolution. And over about 20 years, there've been some isolated observations where it suggests that this, these viruses that are embedded in all of our DNA become overactive in sporadic motor neuron disease. And these are some um, uh, sections out of uh, human nervous tissue that show evidence of these HERV-K proteins in neurons in people with motor neuron disease. So we wanted to ask the question, can antiretrovirals drugs impact HERV-K replication? Because we didn't know that. And can antiretroviral drugs slow or stop the progression of sporadic motor neuron disease? So this study that we published two years ago is the first safety and tolerability study. And in 40 patients, it was an open labeled study where we, we watched people for 10 weeks and then we treated them for six months with three drugs, abacavir, lamivudine and dolutegravir. So say that quickly for me. And it was a once a day tablet and we really wanted to see was it safe and did people tolerate it? So we screened 44 people and 35 people finished the trial. And they had an average age of 45 years. They were fairly early in disease. They were only 10 months post-diagnosis on average. All patients were on Rilazole and we had a two to one male to female ratio. And we were able to show that Triamec is safe and well tolerated and it didn't interfere with Rilazole. So these were the main aims of the study. But we did actually, we were able to demonstrate in secondary outcomes that we suspect that Triamec is able to slow motor neuron disease a little bit. So we measured motor neuron disease with this scale called the ALS-FRSR. We measured vital capacity, this, this uh, nerve conduction study measure called the Neurophysiologic Index. And we looked at some biomarkers as well as survival. So if you look at the pre-treatment slope, so this is a slope of ALS FRSR, and we're measuring pre-treatment uh, in, the, in the blue line to the left of the first dotted line, and then on treatment. And when we measure the slope of those lines, we could, we could demonstrate that we could slow the rate of progression by about 60%. We weren't able to show much in the way of forced vital capacity, but I'll come back to that. And then in this neurophysiologic index, so as the disease gets worse, usually the blue line has a slope from left to right, but during the treatment period, we could show a flattening out of this curve, both in the right hand and in the left hand. <clears throat> we could look at people's urine. So if you look at people's urine with motor neuron disease, there's a marker called P75. And normally as the disease progresses, the marker of this P75, which is a marker of nerve damage goes up. But we were able to show that during the six months of treatment, this P75 marker actually ended up lower than when it started. And that's the first time that's ever been demonstrated in a clinical trial. 
Furthermore, when you measured Herve K in people's blood, and we did this in collaboration with Avindra Nath at the National Institutes of Health, we could demonstrate that we could suppress this Herve K with in, in the cohort of people who were taking this Trimex. So we could suppress this virus when you measured it in people's blood. So we wanted to dig into this deeper and with our blood samples that we took through the trial, we collaborated further with Avindra Nath at NIH and we looked at whether there were responders or non-responders, because it's unlikely that everyone's motor neuron disease is going to be related to this HERV-K or HML2. So again, we treated people for six months. It's the same study, it's the same samples, but we just reanalyzed it and we're able to show that when we stopped therapy, in the first sample after they stopped this triamec, the HERV-K levels bounced up. We didn't have a full set of, of blood samples for one reason or another to analyze, but we we're able to show at week four, week eight, week 16, week 20, week 24, a progressive suppression of this HERV-K and post-treatment, the HERV-K bounced up. And when you looked at individual lines of HERV-K, there were clearly non-responders. So these red lines where HERV-K didn't go down and we had other patients where HERV-K went down quite dramatically. And we're able to show that if you were a responder in the blue, then the measures that we used in, the, in measuring the motor neuron disease showed less of a change. So we're able to put the brakes on. So there are numerous questions from this, and, and that is, you know, are we doing the right thing? Are we using enough Triamec? And so the next study uh, called Lighthouse 2 starts in a couple of months in 18 centres in Europe, the UK and Australia. And this is a, a placebo controlled trial to actually work out whether Triamec can change the survival of motor neurone disease. And it's become a little bit bigger than Ben-Hur because there are multiple English uh, uh, British and European sites as well as Australian sites. But we hope to start this trial very soon and we're going to need to enrol 363 people into this design to work out whether Triamec slows and stops motor neurone disease. I've talked before about copper ATSM and copper ATSM is a novel molecule and copper abnormalities happen quite commonly in both animal models and in familial and sporadic motor neuron disease. So I've showed you previously that copper ATSM in a phase one study, we can actually give this molecule safely to humans and that it is, is absorbed and that it may well actually help to slow the disease as we measure it by this ALS FRSR. Again, we had 32 patients in this study and these patients all were on escalation doses of this copper ATSM. We were able to demonstrate that copper ATSM in the special um, formulation was absorbed. So normally copper ATSM is about as soluble as granite. It does disturb people's livers. And so it was quite a nerve wracking study because we had to watch people's livers quite closely. And the majority of people had some asymptomatic changes in their liver tests. We had some patients who had to discontinue their copper ATSM because they had problems with their liver or their bone marrow. We suspect that copper ATSM at 72 milligrams a day is able to slow motor neuron disease a little bit. So the change in ALS FRSR is a little bit less at this higher dose. So we've, we've finished enrolling into this phase two study and we expect that our, so our last patient uh, was enrolled in December, 2020. So doing this study through COVID proved to be quite challenging. And we should have our results by December of this year as to whether this is a therapy that slows motor neurone disease. Lastly, I wanna talk about a new era. So we now actually have some genomic therapies that may well change the face of familial motor neuron disease. 
And Macquarie is the only site in Australia in two special studies. One is a study of a, a medicine called tofersin, which is an antisense RNA oligonucleotide that inhibits the expression of a protein called SOD1. So about 2% of all motor neuron disease is due to a mutation in this uh, enzyme called superoxide dismutase type 1, which is in every cell in our body. And uh, in addition, we are part of a study called the WAVE study, which is, again, use of an RNA uh, oligonucleotide to suppress this gene called c 9 orf 72 So in the middle of last year, this phase 1-2 trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine to show that this medicine, tofersin, is safe. So this is a medicine that's given by lumbar puncture once a month, and they were able to show that increasing levels of this intrathecal tofersin was safe and that we could suppress mutant SOD1 in the CSF at the highest dose of tofersin. So this is a graph that shows increasing doses of tofersin from 20 milligrams to 40 to 60 to 100. And then there's a placebo group in blue. And with higher doses of tofersin, we can use this medicine to suppress this mutant SOD1 in the spinal fluid. And there were lots of other secondary measures, but this, these studies were not actually designed to necessarily demonstrate efficacy, but there are, there's trends to show that the higher doses of tofersin actually help in slowing this form of motor neuron disease. There were a few side effects. So the tofersin does cause headache and people can get a headache from having the lumbar puncture. Some patients have back pain, but generally the medicine was well tolerated. So this ATLAS study that's gonna start over the next few months is a study that is enrolling people who have a mutation in SOD1, and there are 13 specific mutations that are identified in this study. And these patients who are to be enrolled in this study are pre-symptomatic. So they have a mutation, but they don't have clinical motor neuron disease. And the concept of the study is to watch people, observe them, because if they don't have motor neuron disease and there's no evidence of disease activity, there's no point in treating them with this medicine. But once their neurofilament level goes above a certain level, then they will be randomized to either tofersin or placebo to see whether therapy can delay the onset of motor neuron disease. But if people are symptomatic, then they'll be treated with open label tofersin. We're the only site in Australia performing this study and there's only 30 sites globally. So this is the, 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 the first prize in this study is to use this therapy to, to delay the onset of familial motor neuron disease due to mutant SOD1. At the same time, we've been approached and have been awarded this uh, only Australian site to be involved in the WAVE study, to my knowledge. So this is again uh, RNA therapy in people with a mutation in a gene called c 9 orf 72 So these are people who are symptomatic with motor neuron disease due to an abnormality in this gene called c 9 orf 72 And again, that's commencing over the next few months. We have a couple of other therapies coming into the clinic this year. One is an intravenous therapy in early phase development called 3K3AAPC, which is a powerful anti-inflammatory neuroprotective and also has action on the blood-brain barrier. It's already been demonstrated to be safe and has a protective effect post-stroke. And we hope to start this study in quarter three. And this is a study that's been funded by the Fireys Climb for Motor Neuron Disease. And lastly, there's a drug that's been stolen out of, believe it or not, veterinary science that inhibits a pathway called the mTOR pathway. Uh, and in collaboration with Monash University, we'll be starting a phase one study in quarter four. So we're very busy in the trial sector. 
to try and have new therapies into the clinic that have a biological premise to slow and stop motor neuron disease, both genetic motor neuron disease and sporadic motor neuron disease. So I'm going to now hand over to my friend and colleague, Jill. Um, so Jill is going to talk to us about the uh, uh, work that he's been doing over years now to try and understand the regional variation in motor neuron disease that we see in Australia and what are the possible causes of that in our environment that causes motor neuron disease. So Jill, over to you. Thank you, Dom. Um, sorry, I'm going back to the beginning. So yeah, today I just will speak of one part of my research, which is looking at environmental factor uh, linked with motor neuron disease. So just uh, to summarize what Dom uh, already said, uh, there is two types of uh, motor neuron disease, ALS. There's a sporadic and the familial. Familial is about 10% and sporadic is a 90%. Uh, on anyone can get the sporadic cases, but we don't know what's triggering it. So this is what I, uh, I picked when I, I joined, we, we started this motor neuron disease center, is to, want to find any link, potential link with environmental factor triggering sporadic motor neuron disease. Which is interesting, so whatever you have, if it's familial or ALS, the symptom, the way the motor neuron die will be the same. So that's really uh, interesting. So I have four suspects at the moment. So based on a lot of literature on work with uh, from scientists around the world on our own work in the lab, we're looking at four potential targets on factor from the environment can who could separately or together trigger motor neuron disease. The cyanotoxin is also called blue-green algae, but these are bacteria, so they're not, uh, the cyanobacteria, they're not algae, the bacteria. We have pesticide from the, the agriculture, microorganism, Dominic introduced already the virus uh, uh, story, and metal as well. A lot of metal are used in the agriculture. I will start with the most advanced work we started uh, many years ago. That the work about the cyanobacteria on the potential leak with motor neuron disease. You can see on the background that uh, that the Darling River, and you have basically all year now this river stay green, full of this uh, this uh, gloomy uh, green stuff, and there are little things here, these little bacteria. You can see that growing all the time because the because few reasons. I will show you why. One thing interesting actually, you know, these people are always exposed to water. Actually, very interestingly, Lou Gehrig was a fisherman. He spent a lot of time trout fishing around lake on river. I always found that a very fascinating coincidence. So this one is really probably the most important slide of my presentation today. So you may believe or not, but there is a climate change happening in the world. And uh, so basically the temperature of the soil on the water is going up. So if you heat the water, the bacteria are very happy to help them to proliferate. Well, People are putting all agriculture, bring a lot of uh, um, uh, nutrients in a, in a soil, which always end up in a water. And of course, these bacteria love that food. They, they eat it and they proliferate. You give them heat on food. What else? They're very happy. They proliferate. So, what is interesting? Look, this 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 second gut diagram actually that's a number of algal bloom in the Darling uh, River over the last 1994 to 2008. Every year you can see this little thing that's uh, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, but the trend is going up. The number of algal bloom is increasing every year. Even the United Nations now has recognized the algal bloom as a, as, a, as a major issue for human health. What is very interesting, the, this free graph, climate change going up, algal bloom going up, number of motor neuron disease cases going up. Just an observation, nothing we can prove yet, but that's more algal bloom on more MND cases. This one is a very nice uh, map from the Water New South Wales. You can see in real time uh, the, 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 the place the river, in, the, in the Darling River, how many places are in the red alert with algal bloom. You look at this map in summer, basically every single dot is red. So just briefly, the, this cyanobacteria, this cyanobacteria, there are a lot of different type of them. They, they produce about 84 different type of toxin, can be neurotoxin, hepatotoxin or dermatoxin, skin, liver or brain. 
And basically, one thing is really interesting that all, all of subtype, every single type of cyanobacteria, they produce a toxin called the BMA, which is our interest on this BMA target the nervous system. So long story short, we started to do some work on uh, this cyanotoxin BMA and see if they can trigger uh, neuronal death. You can see beautiful picture here on, uh, done in the lab. The, the red staining is marking neurons, a neuron in culture we grow in at Macro Uni. And uh, the blue, the green staining, sorry, is the, the cyanotoxin BMA. You can see basically the, the cyanotoxin is getting inside the neuron and you can see they're making bubbles. They're getting really sick. When they start to be sick, they have this called the blebbing. The motor neuron, the neurons start to, to be sick and die. Very interesting. So clearly, yes, BMA can kill neurons. What even more puzzle, was a big surprise actually. Vanessa Satan, a young postdoc for my group actually, did this work in when she was in Paris. We put neuron on one side on little channel with only the the neuro, the axon can go the other side. So the BMA only the toxin only can be put on that side. What we found, long story short. When she exposed the toxin on that side, it's contaminating these neurons and it will spread around the axon and contaminating the next neuron on, on the next neuron on the next neurons. And as well, even other cells like support cell, brain cell, they all get contaminated by BMA, which is very interesting when you, found, you think about B, uh, ALS, it starts somewhere and it just slowly progress. This disease, this toxin is slowly progressing on propagating in your body as well. Another observation and coincidence. So the question is, does BMA cause ALS or not? I think the closest answer to this question came from a study uh, from my collaborator in the US, Paul Cox, Rachel Dunlop on the team. They, treat, they fed uh, some macaques, some, sorry, some small monkey called vervet for 140 days with, uh, in a food with BMA. And basically, after, at, the, uh, at the end, the, 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 they couldn't see any sign of motor neuron because they had to stop at uh, um, the, the study after, after 140 days. They didn't wait long enough. But when they sacrificed the monkey and they look at the brain on spinal cord, this monkey had all the sign of motor neuron disease, not the uh, clinical sign, but all the pathologic sign in the spinal cord and in neurons. You have all this accumulation in the motor neuron that the control without the BMA, and that's the, the, with the BMA. You can see all this inclusion in motor neuron, TDP43, first, it's all a clear, a obvious of my, all mark of motor neuron disease. If they have been waited another few months, they probably, the monkey will have probably see the sign, clinical sign of motor neuron disease. This 140 days uh, cost 1 million US dollar, right? I think they ran out of money, they couldn't go further. What a shame, they could have probably possibly demonstrated that this cyanotoxin could trigger motor neuron disease. So the work we're doing on, on cyanobacteria and cyanotoxin at the moment, we are trying to detect, getting new technique to detect this toxin in, in food, water, uh, plants. We already have developed a new ELISA kit, very simple test, we can quantify this cyanotoxin. And we, we would like to get a, develop that as a simple, like, you know, like little strip test that like anyone can test food or water in their house. In terms of research, we just keep going on trying to combine different cyanotoxic with pesticide. On test them on fish, uh, rodent, and again with on monkeys. So that's a showing that we can already quantify this toxin. One is another project I have is geolocalization of where are the motor neuron disease cases in New South Wales, and as as this high incidence of motor neuron disease correlate with where are the algal blooms, the cyanobacteria blooms. So we work with uh, MND New South Wales, the, the the postcode of the people who died from MND for the last thirty years. So we generate this map. You can see the Riverina. This area are always in big red or or, or black. And we started to work actually and. Uh, with uh, people uh, in geolocalization. You, you can use satellite that Landsat head. You can see that uh, Ben Chifley Dam. I used to go fishing there. I don't go anymore fishing in these green things in Dam Chifley. And that's the uh, 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 sorry, Darling River. And that's dam in farmland. You can see they're all green full of algal blooms. So long story short, what we're trying to do at the moment with the patient from the Riverina, uh, where DOM have identified their much higher rate of motor neuron disease, is to get collected urine of this patient and quantify cyanotoxin on, on pesticide on metals. 
So basically on metal, you have already many evidence that people uh, in rural area and agricultural area have a higher risk of developing motor neuron disease. So I managed to get the list of the 50 pesticides that have been used basically for the last 70 years in the Riverina. One of them actually is Agent Orange, was very scary. And we basically have started to quantify this pesticide in the urine of about 20 or 30 patients coming from the MND Biobank at Macquarie. And we haven't started the metal yet, but we found some very interesting early data. Some of the patients have about 30 times the normal level of this pesticide in their urine. I'm just to give you an example. This paper got published in a, in a neurology journal, very top journal in neurology. This, this lady tried to kill herself to, to try to commit suicide, taking a big dose of a very common pesticide called paritroid, an insecticide. And then basically she developed all the case, the, the, the sign on the, she developed basically a motor neuron disease. So that's another evidence that some pesticide can be actually associated with the development of motor neuron disease. Dom brought the story about the virus, but I'm very interested in looking at more microorganisms. You have this new technology called meta RNA metagenomic. You can screen, you get a bit of tissue from the patient, and you can basically look at brain on postmortal sample, and you can identify any type of infectious agent, not only ERV virus, but HTLV, HIV, antivirus, parasite, all these all these different microorganisms have always, always been reported to be found in the blood on the spinal cord of patients who died from motor neuron disease. So that's again, that's the four usual suspects we're looking at, so that's cyanotoxin, pesticide, microorganism, and metal. I will stop here. Thank you very much, everybody. Gilles, thank you so much. So Gilles, if you could hit stop share. Yep, um, excellent, brilliant. Um, thank you so much, Gilles, for that um, uh, cook, cook's tour. Now introducing Angela Laird, who runs the zebrafish facility, and she's going to talk to us about how this um, very unique um, asset that we have here at Macquarie is a, a perfect um, platform for us to identify and test new treatments for motor neurone disease. Thanks, Angela. Hi, so I'm Dr. Angela Laird, and I'm going to tell you about the studies that we're doing, um, testing treatments for motor neuron disease using zebrafish. So, first of all, my team is called the Neurodegeneration Treatment Team, and we're located at the Center for MND Research, and our um, focus is on two different neurodegenerative diseases which are motor neuron disease and a related neurological disease called Machado-Joseph disease or MJD. So our team um, works on testing treatments for these diseases, uh, starting from the point of testing in zebrafish. So I'm going to start by telling you why we would use zebrafish, because um, that may not be obvious. So you would probably know that when a researcher wants to test a treatment, they need large um, sample sizes or a large number of subjects because they want to treat one group and not treat the other. And then they want to um, gather a lot of data and compare um, with statistics to see whether the treatment has led to any improvements. Well, luckily with zebrafish, we are able to get very high um, numbers of um, subjects because a female zebrafish can actually produce hundreds of offspring each week. Zebrafish are also very small, so they um, can be housed in a small amount of space, and thus we have about 10,000 within our facility here at Macquarie. Zebrafish are also vertebrates, which means that, um, and, and actually their um, brain has most of the structures of a human brain. They are also transparent during development, which means that we can actually um, watch their neurons developing if we look down a microscope. And particularly if we um, modify the zebrafish to genetically carry colored or fluorescent proteins, such as the green and red shown here, which allows us to see different proteins or cell types. Luckily, it's 
not too hard to, to do that um, genetic modification in the zebrafish. And that also means that we can add genetic material to make the zebrafish express different um, mutated genes that have been found to lead to motor neuron disease. Now, remember, as Jill said, most um, cases of motor neuron disease do not have a genetic cause, but we don't know what's causing those forms of motor neuron disease. So most of our studies focus on adding the human genes that we know can lead to motor neuron disease. But we also can add different environmental factors, such as what Jill talks about, to see whether or not those um, can lead to similar um, motor neuron disease in the zebrafish. And also, luckily, we can add different treatments to um, the water that the zebrafish live in, and that can treat them to do this testing. And finally, zebrafish develop very rapidly. So they actually have movement or um, a swimming reflex in response to stimuli such as a flash of light as early as two days old. So with this in mind, um, my team has formed a pipeline to allow drug testing in the zebrafish. And this includes that we can start by mating male and female zebrafish, and we can collect the eggs that the female spawns. And then in the coming days, we can check under a microscope to see if these are, um, are carrying the fluorescent protein that indicates that they are positive for the, the motor neuron disease gene. And if so, they can go into our um, drug testing. We can add the treatments that we want to test to the water that they are swimming in, and then move forward to testing um, in the days that come, the movement of the zebrafish in response to something like a flash of light. And we can see whether um, the motor neuron disease gene has led to decreased swimming, which is sometimes the case. Um, so shorter distances being swum, and whether different treatments can increase that distance back to um, the same level as the non-MND zebrafish. We've also expanded this pipeline to now be able to use something called flow cytometry to actually quantify or count the number of protein aggregates that are present within the zebrafish because we hypothesize that treatments that can decrease that um, may be protective. And we can also use um, the zebrafish hand in hand with other models such as cell culture models in order to um, test treatments that are found in those studies also in the zebrafish. All of this aiming to find treatments that warrant further more elaborate um, testing within other models, such as perhaps rodent models of motor neuron disease and always moving closer to the clinic. So now I'd like to just tell you about um, some of the studies that we're doing in our team. And this one in particular uh, started from back in about 2016, when some members of the research center, Dr. Kelly Williams and Professor Ian Blair's teams um, identified that mutations in this um, CCNF gene can lead to motor neuron disease in some families. So following on from that, Dr. Alison Hogan within the zebrafish team was able, to, um, was able to add the genetic material that encodes that mutant um, gene and found that by two days old, the zebrafish that carry this mutation had um, shorter motor neurons, which you can see in this picture here, where these circles are the cell bodies of the motor neurons within the spinal cord. And these lines are the axons projecting from the motor neurons. So this distance was shorter, the, the axons were shorter um, in those with the mutation. And in correlation with that, these animals also swam shorter distances during testing. At the same time, Professor Julie Atkins team also from the center was working on um, findings that had really um, began to um, build a body of evidence to suggest that cellular transport um, was also impaired in motor neuron disease and that this may be a good target for new therapies. So luckily, um, Julie was able to get some funding from FITEMND to perform a collaborative study to test 
for a therapy that may um, rectify that um, cellular transport. And my team's role within that study was to test these different um, compounds that were produced by some chemists within the study on the CCNF zebrafish. So you can see within this graph the findings from that, where the mutant zebrafish swim shorter distances than those that do not carry the mutant CCNF. And in these white columns are all different groups of the mutant um, expressing zebrafish, where we have tested the effect of treating with all these different um, compounds or drugs. And we were able to find that some of them had protective effects and improved the swimming of the zebrafish back towards that of those that didn't carry the mutation. We were able to identify um, the, the compound that looked like it had the most um, positive benefit. And all of this was also confirmed by Julie's team and their cell culture models. And now um, this candidate is being tested in two different mouse models also of motor neuron disease. Another study that I want to tell you about um, started by my um, team firstly in the other disease I mentioned, MJD. And we found that in zebrafish that um, model this disease, that they also swim shorter distances during this testing, which you can see by these um, less lines in, the, in, this, um, in these circles. So if we take these zebrafish and we treat them with um, a particular drug that we chose due to its capacity to potentially remove protein aggregates, we found that these zebrafish can swim um, longer distances, suggesting that it may be having a protective effect. We also found that treating with this drug can actually decrease the amount of the mutant protein that produces this disease. So currently my team is um, testing the effect of treating a mouse model of this disease also with the same drug, hoping to see that it may decrease the impaired movement and decrease survival that develops in this disease. But moving back to our um, motor neuron disease studies, we have also been able to expand to test the effect of the same drug in our motor neuron disease studies, including testing the effect of treating a um, in, in treating zebrafish that carry another mutant um, gene related to um, or that can lead to motor neuron disease. And we can see that treating with this drug can lead to a decreased amount of protein aggregates in these zebrafish. And if we look in cell culture models, we can see that whilst expression of the mutant SOD1 gene leads to increased protein aggregates, that if we treat the same cells with this, this um, drug, that we can decrease the amount of protein aggregates and that actually we can even um, decrease the amount of the mutant protein um, in another model as well. So we're hoping that we might be able to take this drug also into um, rodent studies from MND into the future. So that's just a snippet of what we've been doing. We're actually testing a whole range of different treatments and um, investigating a range of different pathways that may also be involved in the disease. And I hope that I've been able to give you some insight into why we use zebrafish and showing you that um, the use of zebrafish really can help by doing these rapid studies that can identify which treatments warrant further, more elaborate um, investigation in the rodent models and always hoping to get closer to the clinic. I'd like to finish by thanking the researchers that were involved in the, the results that I um, have shown you today and the funding bodies that um, helped fund the research. But I'd also like to thank um, everybody who has shown interest in the centre and provided donations over um, time because it's through that assistance that some of these projects were able to commence and that also even some um, valuable um, equipment has been able to produce this, these results. So I'll hand back to Dom to hand on to the next speaker. Thanks, Angela. So, and Angela's work um, 
highlights the importance of basic science in understanding mechanisms of cellular damage and to produce novel therapies to slow and stop motor neuron disease. And, you know, the, the, the critical role of basic science in understanding this disease can't be emphasized enough. I'm gonna pass over to Rosie Fell now. So Rosie is one of our genetic counselors and we manage at any one time the care of about 200 people with motor neuron disease. And some of those patients have a faulty gene as the cause of their motor neuron disease. And we look after about 78 families who have a familial form of motor neuron disease. And this is indeed um, a very important part of our work in supporting those families to understand the impact of genetic abnormalities and managing their care um, over time, ultimately so that we can actually get rid of these faulty genes um, and um, get rid of familial motor neuron disease. So again, I'll, I'll just pass over to Rosie. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks, Dom. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to talk tonight a little bit about the genetic counselling um, and motor neuron disease um, that happens here at the clinic. So some of um, the information, uh, where's my next slide? Let me see if I, there we go. Uh, some of this I'm going to talk about has kind of been covered already. Um, thanks, Gilles and um, Angela. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about like some of the causes of motor neuron and, and we talk about sporadic versus familial motor neuron disease. Um, and as uh, Gilles said, so sporadic um, motor neuron disease is where we don't have any family history. It, it accounts for probably 90% of motor neuron disease. And we don't really know what the causes are. And some of those um, things that Gilles was talking about are some of the things that we think might be involved. So what about that other 10%? Um, that other 10% that we refer to as familial um, is where we know that there is uh, evidence within a family um, that there are multiple people that have um, developed motor neuron disease and that we believe that that um, motor neuron disease has been caused by some change in, a in the, the DNA within a gene that causes motor neuron disease. Now that sounds all very lovely and simple and wouldn't it be lovely if there was just the one gene that we knew caused motor neuron disease and we might have a lot more answers than we do now. Unfortunately, that's not what we're looking at. So what we know about MND and um, the genes that uh, cause it, um, this is a bit of an old slide, but it gives you the, um, it gets the message across. So back in 1993, um, was when we uh, first identified the SOD1 gene as being a gene that is responsible for um, causing motor neuron disease in families. And since that time, we can see there's been almost an exponential um, sort of discovery of more and more genes come, happening. And we're up to now, um, now in sort of 2020, we're up closer to sort of 40 genes actually um, but I just want to draw your attention uh, back in 2011, there was this gene called the C9ORF72 gene, which Dom actually mentioned earlier in his talk. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and between the C9ORF72 gene and the SOD1 gene, they, um, the changes in those genes are, are believed to account for probably up to 60% of that 10% of familial MND that we were talking about. So, um, so they're kind of, um, this is why we kind of look at genes and look for um, what could be the cause of the motor neuron disease in, in families. So what is genetic counselling and where, do, where does this, knowing this gene, what, what does, um, where does that fit in? Um, so genetic counselling comes up, is made up of a variety of different things. So we've got the interpretation of family um, and medical histories. Um, we've got the education about the condition and, and what supports are out there and resources are out there to families. We, we include counselling to promote informed choices and, and counselling to um, make sure people are informed when they're making their decisions. And it also involves the support um, through the adjustment to any results that come out through the process. So these things could be done by... Uh, different clinicians um, and I guess where a genetic counsellor comes in is that we're actually trained to cover in all all four of these areas um, so this is um, an image of myself and my colleague Ashley 
we're both um, genetic counsellors who have master's degrees and are here based at this um, clinic to help support people. So why would you want to know? Why would you want to know? I get asked all the time, why would you want to know what your gene um, status is? And, and I think it's important to remember that we are all different and there are some people that want to know, want to be able to make decisions um, for their lives. And there are others that think, I, I don't know that I would want to know. And, I, and I, I think we all come from different areas. We all come from different backgrounds and we've had different life experiences. And it's important for um, people to be able to talk through those experiences and be able to talk through why they believe what they believe and, and, and be able to come to their informed decisions. So I think one thing about all of us here tonight, um, I think we're all on the same page in that what we really want is to a, a world without MND. Um, and that's what this whole webinar this evening is about, is how can we get this world without MND um, and, and actually stop MND. And so the earlier talks have been about different ways that the research has been looking to do that. And I guess what I want to draw attention to here and through the genetic counselling side of things is that we actually have an option for stopping MND in familial MND that has a known gene change. And that's through a process called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And this is something that can be done through IVF. Um, so it's not a simple thing, but it, it requires a known DNA change, as I said. And then they're able to test the embryo for that DNA change and only implant a healthy embryo um, to then come forward to a, uh, a healthy pregnancy. So in using this technique, we can actually stop MND and stop it from being passed on to the next, the next generation. Sorry. Now, I, I can say all of that and it sounds like it's so simple, doesn't it? Um, but it's not that easy and, and you know, it's, it is a difficult process to go through. IVF is not to be um, something that everybody wants to be able to go through that process and it's also a very expensive technique. Um, so whilst we can do it and it is possible, um, it's not always possible for everybody um, and that's where genetic counselling comes in. So now I want to move into talking a bit about what sort of happens in a clinic setting. So I'm going to talk you through a couple of scenarios. This is David. He's uh, 55 years old and has recently um, had a diagnosis of motor neurone disease. So for him, we'd be talking to him um, as he has a diagnosis of motor neurone disease about the possibility of something called diagnostic testing. So David sees his uh, neurologist and this is a really good neurologist who not only takes the medical history, but also looks at the family history. Now, David's parents, his dad's still alive and well, but his mum passed away when he was quite young. Um, she was in her 40s and was in a motor vehicle accident. Um, but David's sister, a couple of years ago, developed motor neurone disease um, and she actually passed away. And now at, at the time she developed the condition, she was, basket, like she was placed into the basket of, of thinking it was a sporadic condition because there was no other family history there to suggest that there could have been um, a familial form. But now that David's come along and he's also been diagnosed, it's flagged that perhaps this could be a familial version of the condition. So David's neurologist offers genetic counselling to David and David and his wife are able to meet with the genetic counsellor and to talk through with them what the options are available to them, what, um, you know, to talk through what, what it means for it to be familial and just make sure that they're all on the same page and understanding. Because doing a genetic test in David is not just like all the other tests that he will have been going through to get to this point. Um, a test in David for a diagnostic test has implications for the wider family. So the genetic counsel will go through some of those pros and cons of doing the testing. And it's really important that David understands not only what the pros are for himself, but also for his wider family. Um, and, and really that's where the opportunity to talk through these things with a genetic counsellor comes into its own. So there are lots of pros and cons for people to consider. And the genetic counsellor usually encourages um, the, the patients to talk to their families about this. And this can go either way. Yeah, I, you know, I often find um, couples who 
actually don't want to trouble their children. They don't want to scare them at this point into thinking that there might be a chance that it's something that could be passed on. And, you know, that's totally fine. But sometimes people want to include their families in these decisions. Um, and so we can help them do that and, and help them with those conversations um, as well. So what does David decide to do? Well, to be honest, it actually doesn't matter. It's really down to the individual and their um, decision as to what to what they how they want to proceed. There's no right or wrong decision, um, but David should feel supported throughout that, um, and just the genetic counsel is just there to to support them. So let's say hypothetically, David um, did decide to go ahead with the testing, um, and and a and a. They, we tested the C9 off gene and an expansion in that gene was identified as the cause of David's, genetic, of, um, David's motor neurone disease. So a couple of years down the track, let's say um, we might meet Jack and Jack is David's son. Um, David has now unfortunately passed away, um, but Jack might reach out to someone like myself at the, at the clinic here um, to talk about what his options are. He knows that his dad, oops, let me go back. He knows that his dad um, received uh, genetic testing and he knows that there is an expansion in his family, um, but he's now at a point where he um, and his wife are thinking about having a family and they wanna know what their options are. Um, so it's important at this point to make sure that someone who's coming for predictive testing um, so in Jack's uh, case, he does know his father and he knew his father's condition, but often um, we find with motor neurone disease families that there might be a bit of um, disconnect with people um, and people might not be aware of the um, individual in their family who had the condition. So um, genetic counselling includes making them aware of that condition, talking about the different gene mutations um, and, and what the impact of a positive or negative result might be for themselves and for their family. Uh, and so just talking through all those different things. And it's important to, to really um, talk to the, to the individual about why they're wanting to this testing now. Like what's, what's their driving force for, for this testing now? And quite often it is for reproductive reasons. Um, and so often family, they're, they're at a stage where they think they want to have a family and they are conscious that there is an option to uh, not pass this on, but they want to know what those options are. And look, in the case of Jack, he actually was feeling a little nervous about the opportunity to find out for himself. And he wasn't sure how he would go with actually knowing his gene status. And so he wanted to talk about what other options there might be. Um, and so the genetic counsellor, um, I was able to share with him that um, there are other options available in terms of doing the testing um, that and doing PGD and doing the, the IVF um, where you might not necessarily find out um, the actual result for, um, for, for Jack. Um, so uh, that's, it's, it's a very complicated thing and I'm not going to go into that now, but if that is something that um, you aren't aware of, um, a, of being an option, then I would recommend if you're in a situation like Jack is that, that you do go and talk to a genetic counsellor because there isn't any... Um, you know, going to talk to a genetic counsellor doesn't necessarily mean you will have to have genetic te testing. Um, it just means that you get to have those conversations and talk through what, what options are out there. Um, and just, so just in summary, I guess, I, I just want to sort of um, highlight that whilst we can't stop all of MND at the moment, and these, there is so much work going on to doing that, we can stop familial MND from being passed on to the next generations if we know that gene cause. So there are pros and cons of proceeding with testing and everybody has their own way of working through those, um, those lists and there is no right or wrong decision um, for an individual or for their family. Um, so currently genetic testing doesn't uh, change management um, for those with, with um, motor neurone disease. But as Don was talking about these, um, uh, these trials that are coming into clinic um, very soon, it may well do so in the really not too distant future. So really genetic counsellors are here to support the patients and their families as they go through um, any testing process, including the decision making the communication with others and the support to an adjustment with um, for a result. So that's me. Um, I hope I haven't gone too over, over time. I do tend to talk a lot, but I'm going to hand back to Dom um, so we can move on to hearing from, um, uh, from the, the next speaker. 
Thanks, Rosie. <clears throat> and, you know, the, the issues around genetic testing and identifying genetic causes of motor neuron disease are multifaceted, and it's only with people with the expertise of, of Rosie and Ashley that we can do this um, with skill. So she's a, uh, uh, both Ashley and, and Rosie are very valued members of our motor neuron disease multidisciplinary team. Um, we provide genetic counselling services here uh, as part of the motor neuron disease service uh, free of charge. Ge genetic testing is still not yet covered uh, under the Medicare rebate system. And that's mm -hmm. something that is trying to be resolved um, uh, but, you know, it, it's only really with good genetic counselling and with that knowledge that we'll be able to sort out stopping these genes being passed on to the next generation. So now that we've heard from Rosie, we're going to hear about the per patient perspective from a couple of sisters who've been through the process of genetic counselling. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to Caitlin and Jessica who looked after their mum, Susan, who died from motor neuron disease in 2017. They'd already lost their uncle to motor neuron disease a couple of years earlier. Mm. Caitlin and Jessica are here to share their experiences in the first person. So thank you so much, Caitlin and Jessica. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Caitlin, and this is my older sister, Jessica. We are carriers of a familiar form of MND, and we are also co-founders of a familiar MND support group called MND Genies. Tonight, we would like to share with you our MND journey with you and our experience with genetic counselling and testing. Our journey with MND started in 2010 when our mum's um, brother, our uncle, died of MND in his early 60s. Back then, we'd never heard of MND before, nor did we know that it would ever be hereditary. In 2014, our mum started showing signs of MND, and eight months later, in February 2015, she was diagnosed. We were informed that mum had a familiar form of MND, which is only 10% of cases. The gene that runs in our family is the C9ORF gene, ORF72 gene. Um, and we sadly lost our mum to a battle with MND two and a half years later in 2017. We both decided to get tested to find out if we were also carriers of this gene. Um, there was a 50% chance that we were going to get the gene. Um, within months of mum's diagnosis, we started our genetic counselling and got tested and were eventually given a positive result in three months later. Um, at the time we were told there was a 99% chance of the gene activating and symptoms of MND in our family have started in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, so that gives us a bit of hope that we have time to fight this disease. And some of the reasons why we decided to get tested include one, peace of mind. We thought that if we didn't know about the gene, we'd always be thinking about it, it would always be on our mind. And if we did know about it, it would still always be on our mind. It was a hard decision to make as we knew we'd never be able to settle our anxiety around knowing or not knowing. In the end, we would be more, we decided we'd be more at peace knowing that we had the gene. And so we went forward with genetic testing. Uh, control. Having this knowledge meant that we could make more informed decisions against MND and also we felt that we were smarter than MND itself. Um, we already feel that we are two steps ahead of MND and um, we also have the potential of stopping familial MND in our family and doing the IVF process when we decide to have children. Um, so that was one of our main goals of getting tested, um, which, um, yeah, we are pretty pleased that we can stop familiar MND in our line. A quicker diagnosis. It can be a long and difficult process for someone to be diagnosed with MND. It took our mum eight months to be diagnosed, even though we were telling doctors she had MND because our family history. By the time her diagnosis was given, her disease process had progressed. I wanted to know because I thought that if I knew I carried the gene, I would link myself in with the neurologist early. So as soon as I started showing signs, I would be 
would be readily available to either access a preventative medication or hopefully by my time find a cure. Knowing we have the gene has made us hyper aware to look out for any new symptoms or changes in our body. Fight. Knowing we have carry the gene, we've both been very enthusiastic in helping out with research where we can. We donate samples annually to the Macquarie Biobank um, to help with the research. Um, this allows us to use our knowledge to help ourselves and others um, in fighting the disease and in hope finding a cure. Uh, testing is a very personal decision. Uh, we were the only ones in our family who actually decided to get tested. Um, yeah, and in regards to our genetic testing process, um, we went together. It took about three appointments. The first one was um, just sit down counselling. The second one, counselling again and blood test. And then the third one was getting your result. Um, we had a very positive experience in regards to waiting times. We were able to straight go into our appointments after knowing mum had been diagnosed and it took about three months to find out our, po our positive or negative result, which was positive. Um, we had, I think the hardest thing about our testing experience was that we weren't able to do it together. Um, to go in separately. Which I can totally understand that because you know, we can't influence each other's decisions. Um, but we had excellent, excellent genetic counsellors, which support us, supported us then and still continue to support us this day. Um, every day is challenging when you're living with a familiar M&D gene. Um, Jessica and I, I guess we're lucky enough to go th through it together, knowing we're both positive. We are able to pick each other up when we're feeling down and just support each other through the process, which I know many people do it alone and can feel very isolated. Uh, one thing we noticed after getting our results was there was minimal support for people who actually had a gene that had not activated yet. Um, in 2018, we actually met another, um, our friend Rebecca, who also has a MND gene. And it just felt so comforting to be able to talk to somebody who knows what we are feeling and what we are going through. So we came up with the idea of MND Genies, which is a Facebook support group. And we connect with people from all over Australia and we've got a few international people. Um, and we just share stories and our knowledge of MND and just support each other um, through this waiting period. Yeah, um, dealing with the many ups and day, downs day to day, knowing we are positive to a familiar MND gene mutation. We are confident we made the right decision to undergo genetic testing as we are able to plan our life while fighting MND. Um, we will just continue to fight, inform and support for familiar MND. And that concludes our presentation and we'll pass it back over to Dom. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, Jessica. Um, you know, having um, uh, your perspective on going through the process and already having looked after your mum and seeing your uncle is, um, you know, a really tremendous thing to have. So thank you for sharing your perspective. And, and you know, we look forward, like I said, to having therapies that are, enable us to, you know, prolong the preclinical phase of motor neuron disease that's genetic and then dramatically slow the rate of progression of motor neuron disease. So that concludes our presentations. We're only a little bit over time. I think that was because of me, really. I gabbed on a little bit. Um, so I'm going to open up to questions. And if I could ask the panellists to turn on their cameras and, and mics. And what I'll do is, is triage questions as they, they come in. And we've already had a couple of questions come through that I've answered. Um, one of our um, attendees asked whether the recording will be shared. And in fact, it is being recorded and it will be posted on the Macquarie University YouTube channel tomorrow. And we'll have a transcript that we'll be able to post and we'll follow up everyone who's attended um, with a, an email and a link to that. And then the people who've registered who haven't been able to log on tonight 
for whatever reason, we'll follow up with them as well. Um, and, you know, we may even put it on Twitter. Um, we had a, a question from Ian. Um, so he was interested about monopantil and how it's come from uh, the veterinary uh, world. And it, it's a very curious drug. And he asked about why not rapamycin. And to my understanding, rapamycin has been used in quite a few preclinical studies. And the monopantil work is, is very early um, to see whether it's safe. So to help us with, with motor neurone disease. If anyone else has any other questions, there's a, the Q&A box down the bottom of your Zoom. Um, uh, and, um, you know, just type, type the questions um, or pop something in the chat and I can allocate them out um, to the panelists. Um, Gilles, I had a question about some of the work in, in the environment, if I could start off. Um, would it be helpful if um, motor neurone disease was in fact a notifiable disease? So at the moment, we don't know who has it and where. So, you know, if you're in Griffith and you have motor neurone disease, um, everyone in Griffith in a town of 30,000 people knows that you've got motor neurone disease and the, the same in Wagga. And we've had some of our attendees tonight logging in from Griffith and, and Wagga. But we've had patients who live four doors from each other in Wurunga and they neither of them knew that the other one had motor neurone disease. Would it be a helpful thing in the epidemiology of, of our studies to, to have motor neurone disease as a notifiable disease? And, and why is it not notifiable? Um, I think you, it's a rhetorical question, Doug, you know that. It will be so much easier for my work having this kind of localization. Where are the people? Uh, instead of trying to find them by cleaning differently, we can find the one for seeing you at Macquarie Uni. You have to ask MND in New South as well. If it was not defeatable, we could find them straight away. It would be so much easier for us. Uh, it's, it's a challenge. I know We know that it's a big challenge. And uh, so I hope you have the strength to change that because you are the men. <laughs> well, are there, are there any other countries that you know of that where motor neurone disease is a notifiable disease? I don't know what actually, I don't know. You know that is answer? Yeah, yeah, France. So <laughs> in, in your home country, it's notifiable. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we, it would be great if, if we actually knew who had it and where. Absolutely, yeah. Well, we've, we've got no questions coming through. I must have bored you all to sleep. I think maybe you're, you're, you're just, um, uh, no, no questions at all. We're happy to entertain any questions. We were obviously all too clear in our presentations. <laughs> what we want to think, yeah. Well, but before we get, um, uh, we got a, a lovely message there from Martin. Thank you, Martin. He's just said to all the panelists, thank you for your excellent presentations. Keep up the good work. Um, I do have to thank uh, Nicola and Megan, who've been instrumental in, in pulling all this um, together. Um, if we don't have any more questions, we might actually get a, a 10 minute early mark. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone for, for logging in and, and listening to um, Angela and Rosie um, Caitlin, Jessica, and Jill. Um, we look forward to our next webinar, hopefully later this year, and we can highlight some of the other work of the, you know, 90 odd people who turn up every day um, to, to work on motor neurone disease. Uh, we just have, Nikki has just posted a, a question to us is, is it passed through one parent or either parent? Well, um, uh, Rosie, do you want to answer that question? I'll pass it to I you. Yeah, I can answer that, Dom. Um, it, um, it can be passed through either parent, but it, it is usually, it's only passed through one parent. So you would inherit it from either your mother or your father, um, depending on, on which line it was coming through and whose family it had come down through. So I hope that makes sense, Nikki. Uh, Louise, to all the panellists, thank you for your um, terrific presentations. Great to hear the sisters talk about their experiences. Caitlin and Jessica, again, thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it takes a lot to 
come out and talk about something that's very, very personal and, uh, you know, particularly that you've, um, uh, the, the experience that you've been through. Uh, Helen, Helen also says to the panelists, thank you very much. Thank you all very much. My first webinar experience. <laughs> there we go. You've been Zoomed, Helen. Um, and one uh, I'm going to close off now. So again, uh, Tom, thank before you. Before you close off, there's a couple of questions that have come into the Q&A. Oh, okay. Better. Um, so Nola has asked, how important is it to know what type of MND you have? Um, Nola, I'm not sure if you're referring to um, in terms of genetic testing um, and, and whether you're referring to in terms of a type, um, whether that's like where the onset is um, or um, it's, it, it, I mean, it all comes down to that taking of the family history and, and that guides us in some of the different genes that we will look at. Um, and looking at, at, at different, might send us towards different genes to, to look at, but um, it doesn't preclude you from uh, having a conversation with someone about genetic testing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Nola, wait, sorry, I, before you so go, there's another one. <laughs> I was thinking about what sort of type, whether it was a flail limb or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So yes, yes, indeed. Um, the, the type of motor neuron disease is important in, in many different ways. So um, categorizing the form of motor neuron disease is, is very important, Nola. Um, we've had another question from Joanne about if your family member died a while ago and it wasn't familial, can genetic testing still be done? Well, it depends on whether the person had a DNA sample stored uh, because our genetic uh, testing is much, uh, is much more sophisticated now, even this just from five years ago. Um, so genetic testing can be done if there's a DNA sample. Uh, does familial motor neuron disease have a particular ethnic link? Uh, Rosie, do you want that one? Um, no, is the short answer. Um, it's, it's not, it, there's no, I mean, there are different, um, there'll be different mutations or different changes in the gene that are in different ethnicities. Um, but it's, it affects all different ethnicities. Yeah, so again, just to expand on that, for example, we, you've heard us talk about C9 or 72, and, and that is very, very rare in Asian populations, in Han Chinese and Japanese. So SOD1 is much more common in Chinese and Japanese populations than C9. So there is some variation, but familial motor neuron disease occurs in all um, uh, races. Do genes causing MND mutate spontaneously starting new familial groups? This is an excellent question, Merlin. Thank you so much. Um, so all of us have mutations. When we're formed as embryos, uh, in comparison to our parents, when you look at whole genome sequencing from the, the child to both parents, there are hundreds of different mutations that occur spontaneously. And sometimes those mutations occur in sensitive genes like SOD1, and that, that can be calculated out. And there are what are called trios, where you look at the genes of the mother and the father and the child who has, for example, event, eventually develops SOD1 motor neuron disease, and that SOD1 gene isn't abnormal in the parents and that can actually be worked out. It's a very rare um, event and it depends on the gene and how, what sort of, what are called hotspots within the genes. So we, we don't, there, there are spontaneous mutations that occur all the time in when you uh, make eggs and sperm and when they combine to make an embryo. Um, and sometimes that can be unlucky enough that it occurs spontaneously in a gene that results in motor neuron disease. Statistically, that's calculated out at about one in 13 million. So it is a very rare event, but it does occur. Uh, Rosie, did you have anything to add? No, I think you, you yeah, I would say it, it does occur, but it's pretty rare, yeah. Uh, Greg Solomons. Um, uh, Greg, uh, how close are we to having a home testing kit for BMA? Um, yeah, uh, would, I want to test it in my pool water. Uh, Gilles, off you go. We are the only 
group in a world. We are developing an antibody actually can recognize BMA. We are the only group in a world we can do that. That's why I could show you the picture of the staining with BMA in neurons because we have this antibody. So we're currently developing a, a kit and a simple ELISA kit to quantify this BMA on other toxins, two of them actually, the worst two, the worst one, in a simple test. So this one, when it's validated, the next step is to get a, the sterile strip, you know, like just put that in your urine, your, your glass of wine, or <laughs> the water. Sorry, I'm French, it's Pinot Noir, okay? And uh, you will be able to test basically everything you want, especially like if you have fish, because fish, concentrate like oyster, mussel, they concentrate this toxin in uh, when they filter the water. So if you're not sure about the origin, you can test one of the oysters. Say, Ooh, no, 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 I'm not eating this oyster. So the concept is to have this strip in your house, testing water, especially if you live around an uh, area with uh, lake, green lake or green river. That's, uh, that's, that's in progress work, but we're already very advanced in this kit. Thanks, Jill. Um, the next question from Mike is, What's the growth in occurrences in Australia? Well, we can answer this quite categorically. So motor neuron disease as a cause of death in 1986 was one in 500. And Gilles showed this graph before and he may share it with you again. In 2013, it was one in 180. So it's a 257% increase as the cause of death in Australia. Now that can only be environmental and from Belgium and from France, where there are good um, uh, death notices, um, they have exactly the same increase in, in motor neuron disease as a cause of death. And I need to highlight that that's not a diagnostic issue. That's what kills you when you die. That's one of the free graphs I show with the increasing yeah. in the climate change, increasing in algal bloom, increasing in cases of motor neuron disease. We did this diagram together, John, based on the on a death certificate. We the, did, the... yeah. Um, are there practical limitations for genetic testing? Yes, there are. Um, so availability of genetic counselling. So genetic testing should, in my opinion, only be done with good genetic counselling. It shouldn't be done um, ad hoc by you know spitting in a tube and sending it off overseas. It, there's a whole heap of factors that need to be talked about. Um, currently, in our clinic, genetic counselling comes uh, free of charge. And um, the other alternative is to do it through the public hospital system. Um, we try and short circuit that latency. I, I very firmly believe that genetic testing should only be done um, in an environment that gives you enough information to make the decision rationally. Um, Catherine, uh, I've heard it in the future, motor neuron disease will be treated with a cocktail of drugs. Indeed, that is the case. And that, that is likely to be where we will be when we understand much like some forms of cancer that um, we use multiple approaches to change the biology of the disease. And um, there, are, there are multiple pros and cons uh, in, into doing that. It's, it's difficult enough doing the clinical work and the trials, let alone doing it with two drugs. Uh, and the next question is, if it's not a familial cause, what does cause MND? <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's what we're trying to get to the bottom of. Um, thank you. Uh, the zebra fish model has so many advantages. Angela, this one's for you. How close are we to early trials of our lab findings in humans? So our um, studies are, are looking really at a preliminary um, screen and they've still got to make it through the other rodent models um, before they could be looked into for um, patient treatment trials. So I would say probably um, we're talking, you know, five years at least before we would get to even to that point, um, maybe around that. Um, and the next part of the question was whether... Um, Zebrafish have actually led to other treatments of other diseases. And there are some examples of this um, having occurred and is being used um, by other researchers um, in a range of different fields. Thanks. Thanks, Angela. And then back to you, Jill, from Danielle. Um, environment. If toxins can concentrate in fish and we eat fish, can that lead to motor neuron disease? Good point. Uh... They, they've done that with a monkey. They fed the monkey for 140 days. They found if you have to eat basically contaminated fish every day for 140 days. 
The problem actually is not ingesting the, the toxin, is breathing them. There are studies showing in, in US, in France, but if you live under a lake, under the wind, you have much more risk to develop motor neuron disease because you, you're breathing the toxin. And if you, do, if you do water sport on a lake, green lake with toxin, cyanobacteria, if you do water skiing, you have four times the, the risk of developing motor neuron disease because the engine is making all these small uh, droplets. You breathe this droplet, they go to your olfactory system and reach your brain. So it's all, about, I think the risk of breathing it is as probably even higher than ingesting it. Thanks, Jill. Well, we're just on uh, 8.30. Uh, again, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for logging in um, uh, to the webinar tonight. And I'd like to thank all the panelists, uh, particularly Caitlin and Jessica for sharing their story. Um, Nick Cole from, from the um, UK M&D Association is very keen, Caitlin and Jessica, to be in touch to share um, uh, experiences with their um, uh, people that they help. Um, and uh, again, as I said, thank you so much to Nicola and to Megan and the team from events and the team from advancement. Um, we hope to have our uh, gala <laughs> later in the year. So uh, we'll send down an advance notice about that. And we hope to do this again in about six months time. So with that, I'm going to say good night and sign off.